think there's a lot spoken that seems to say if only church leaders were bolder, stronger, more forceful, government would do what they wanted. Um, actually, we weren't in that position at all. We were in the position of government having made decisions that were going to be imposed. Um, they listened to our concerns, they listened to our objections, but in the main largely ignored them. So I think there was also a reality that the church had relatively little power in terms of influencing the government in, in what it did. I believe that retrospectively the, the, the narrative is actually um, is actually changing and the tide is turning on this one, but, but certainly at the time um, it, it's, uh, it is our responsibility to engage our minds uh, and also to open our Bibles and to do our theological reflection as well. And if we're being told something that's highly questionable from an epistemic or an epistemological perspective, we don't have to simply accept it just because it's being told us by the government. Hello and welcome to today's show. If you're new here to the channel on YouTube, do make sure to like today's video and indeed subscribe to the channel for more great conversations. You can also find loads more conversations on our regular podcast and via our newsletter as well. We'll even send you a free ebook if you subscribe to that. The links are with today's show. Today, we're talking about COVID and Christians. Did the church give away too much to the state? As the global pandemic begins to subside, many churches are still feeling its after effects, especially in reduced numbers at worship services. But during the crisis, some church leaders were openly critical and even rebellious about the government restrictions that were imposed on gatherings. In fact, a number of church leaders recently signed the Frankfurt Declaration of Christian and Civil Liberties, concerned at what they see as state over reach into the vicinity of the church. One of those who signed is Jamie Franklin. He's a Church of England priest who co-hosts the Irreverend podcast. He's been critical of his own church and the national response to COVID, believing that it's set a dangerous precedent for government overreach. On the other side of today's discussion is John Stevens, National Director of the FIEC, the Fellowship of Independent Evangelical Churches in the UK. Now, John has encouraged churches to abide by the government mandates and has supported the rollout of the vaccination programme. So as the dust begins to settle and COVID remains a polarising issue among Christians, we're asking, did the church give too much away? So John and Jamie, welcome along to the show. Hi, Justin. Thank you, Justin. Let's get uh, your your background a little bit. John, um, tell us about FIEC and your, your role there first. Um, yeah, FIEC is a national grouping of about 630 independent evangelical churches all across the country. FIEC is not a denomination, so we don't control the churches. We can't tell them what to do. We provide advice, help and um, support. I've been national director for 12 years. Before that, I was pastor of a church in central Birmingham. So um, that's my background. By background, I'm a lawyer, so I was converted when I was a law student at university. So uh, my background is in uh, law, particularly charity law and charity governance, um, but I've been leading FIEC now for 12 years. And you've obviously been very involved as an organisation helping churches through the last two years. Um, what, what's been the overall effect that you've seen on the churches in your network, John? Um, in honesty, as we come out of it, um, actually, I, I think we've been really encouraged. I think it's been obviously a massively testing time for churches. But I think many of our churches weathered the COVID crises remarkably well. They're essentially word-centred churches and we're able to move very rapidly onto uh, kind of online platforms to enable people to hear the word taught, to engage with one another through Zoom. That's not that they wanted to do that. They would ideally have wanted to meet physically. We're committed to wanting to gather as the people of God to praise to hear his word, to celebrate the sacraments. But in the particular circumstances that we faced, the vast majority of our churches were able to move very rapidly into an online uh, format. Um, most of our churches met as much as they could within the restrictions. So um, uh, actually it was a relatively limited period of time that churches were actually required to close. And then they were able to um, uh, open with various limitations on what they could do. Um, and most of our churches took the opportunity to meet as much as they possibly could. So even if they couldn't meet um, uh, physically as church, they would gather as groups of six in gardens or outside for prayer, for fellowship. As soon as it became possible to meet together, they were willing to come back together, even with the restrictions of face masks and the restrictions on mingling. So generally, many of our churches took maximum opportunity within what the law was allowing to meet mm. when, whenever whenever they could do that. 
I think quite a lot of our churches have seen significant growth over this period. There are people who have been attracted to church by watching online services and they've um, sort of seen um, the gospel proclamation, gospel faithfulness. And there's, there's been quite a lot of movement into churches as a result of that. And honestly, I would say over the last two years, we've had more reports of conversions and baptisms over this mm. two year period than actually I've seen in the 10 years before that. So it's been a really difficult time for church. There are obviously massive challenges. Um, churches have lost people people fringes have disappeared um, it's been difficult to remobilize teams of volunteers back together but at the same time there's been those blessings of um, uh, uh, kind of growth um, uh, gospel focus conversion so I, I think this has been a time of refining um, for many of our churches smaller churches and churches with weaker leaderships have really struggled and there have also been some remarkable examples of kind of love and service. So churches serving the community through support groups, through kind of food banks. In many churches, people have made a huge effort to include people uh, who are elderly. So, for example, there were churches going around giving people laptops, helping them to be able to kind of engage into uh, kind of services. And those, I think, have been wonderful examples of love and care in what was an extraordinarily difficult situation. Great. Thank you very much, John. Uh, Jamie, uh, tell us a little bit about your own church background and yeah, what you saw during the lockdown, especially in terms of uh, your church and the churches that, that you've engaged with. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you very much, Justin, for, for having me on. And I, I appreciate this conversation very much. I'm very grateful to John being here as well. Um, I, I'd like to say at the beginning that um, just make it clear that I'm part of the Church of England. So we're a different organisation to John's organisation and uh, we will have had different institutional responses to to what happened so my remarks aren't really um directed at john necessarily and um john we we've never met we just had a nice chat before we were recording which was very pleasant and john seems like a very godly man and i, I really hope this is a a productive conversation i i, I already feel very um, pleased to hear John saying about the fact that their church has met as much as as much as possible, um, given the restrictions that were were laid upon the church at the time. So that that to my mind is is a very good thing. Uh, my background, um, well, I'm actually a sort of culturally evangelical Christian. I found my way into the high church of the Church of England during the ordination process, really, and um, I've I've not been ordained for very long. I'm I'm a fourth year curate so I've only been on the ground in parish ministry in this role for three years but um, I have had lots of experience in ministry in other contexts as well. Um, I'm in a parish in, in Nottingham and um, very differently to John I'm not involved in any kind of official high level institutional response. I'm all I can do is give my perspective as someone on the ground and as somebody who's 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 thought about this and um, and you know, give my own experience from from that perspective, I yeah. suppose. Um, so, it, so is that is that enough for that question, Justin? Or would you like to? Ask me yeah, to absolutely. But well, I was going to say with the irreverent pod mm. and mm. generally with some of the things you've been writing and talking yeah. about, I think you've become a bit of a sort of rebellious voice <laughs> uh, in in the Church of England. Um, so tell us about sort of yeah. you know what perhaps you know maybe take us through the early time yeah, you know yeah. how, how the initial response as it were in the that first lockdown and what your feelings were and and, and how things developed from from there yeah, sure so i think justin um i found the initial response um well I, I have to try and choose my words carefully but but i was very surprised that there wasn't a more robust response from the church hierarchy when especially when we were chose when we were told to close the churches down um it was it was extremely worrying to me um the institutional response not not just because we acquiesce so readily to the churches being closed down but the apparent enthusiasm that there was on display um the most well-known example of this would be that clergy were actually we weren't banned from going into our churches to pray and to live stream services but we were told that we shouldn't do those things and we should shut our churches completely even even you know even for prayer for us clergy for we clergy uh, even though we were still allowed to enter the churches to maintain the buildings and to run food banks from them Many priests um, live next door to their churches or indeed their churches are even part of their own houses. So they were essentially banned from praying in part of their own houses. And this was um, this was perplexing to lots of people at the time uh, because we couldn't understand why it was that there was this apparent enthusiasm for closing down all semblance of Christian ministry and embodied Christian witness 
in the community at a time when it seemed that we had uh, we had um, a great opportunity to be a presence for people in the community, particularly parish churches. And the fact that these these great churches, which are all over the country in the centre of their communities, were were closed, that their doors were were literally shut. Um, people could not go in there to pray, not even clergy could go in there to pray and ring the bells and so on. This was, to me, it was, um, well, I have to say, it was really quite a devastating moment. Um, it was it was a really hard thing to, to live through um, emotionally and, and spiritually. And I suppose the way I would characterise it is to say that it really felt like there was a kind of managerial response from the institution of the church and there wasn't a sense in which we were being led spiritually or pastorally we were just told shut the churches run a food bank if you want uh, but don't don't try and don't try and do any sort of embodied ministry and that was really that was a really difficult thing justin not just for me but for for many people as well yeah um about the podcast if i if i could say we started Mm, the podcast in november i think it was um in uh 2020 so things have been going on for about six months and we did that really so it's me and a couple of other clergy um who have sort of broadly similar takes on things uh because we felt like there was a, a lack of robust pastoral spiritual theological engagement with with the culture more generally coming from the church, but specifically at the time from from COVID. And we really felt like um, there was an opportunity there to have a voice in the in the public square. So we started the podcast and we've been really surprised actually by how enthusiastic the reception of the podcast has actually been. Um, we have lots of people who listen to us and, and even more even more so than the, the numbers of people who listen to us, we get messages all the time from people saying, we wish we'd heard this kind of institutional response, specifically from the Church of England, but more generally as well. Uh, we were looking for something and the church wasn't giving it to us and 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 they found that to an extent, I'm sure imperfectly, but in our podcast, uh, uh, um, in, mm. in a sense. And and the the other thing we have a lot is people writing to us and saying they've actually become Christians through this time, even though they've lost they've lost any sense of connection that they might have with their local churches. It's something we hear a lot is people saying, you know, we want to be Christians or I feel I have become a Christian, but I don't I no longer feel a connection with the church. I don't know how to connect with the church, given the institutional response to what's happened. So I don't yeah, I don't really know what to make of all of this, but that's yeah. where I sort of mm. feel we're at. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Do, do you do you sympathise with any of that, John? What what's been your your experience? Um, yeah, I do sympathise with that, and I think there are differences in ecclesiology. There are different understandings of how the church works and the nature of the church's ministry. There's a difference between a national church and the way that it connects with the community. And uh, FIEC churches would tend to be gathered churches that serve the people who are in membership of them. So that there are different implications for ministry of different approaches within FIEC. We wouldn't have the power to tell our churches what to do, and it was the case that the Anglican Church seemed to go further than the law required at the point that that was launched. Although I I might say that the difference in terms of practical implication for most ordinary church members wouldn't have been very different in terms of the the availability to um, Mm -hmm. to kind of open. Um, I think it's fair to say that most churches and the vast majority of people at the point of the first lockdown were broadly supportive of it and recognised the need for it. I mean, we were faced with a relatively emergency situation, a virus that people didn't know what the full impact would be. And I think it's fair to say that most people thought this would be a pretty short term temporary measure to slow um, the lockdown. So I think some of the judgments that church leaders had to make at the moment of the first lockdown were very difficult because we didn't have um, the full information. We weren't aware of the full circumstances. It was clear government didn't really want to lock down. There'd been a whole process from January to March of watching the progress of the kind of virus. So when lockdown finally came, I think there was an awareness that this was a reluctant step taken by the the, the government. And at that point, I think it was quite difficult for leaders and churches to oppose that. And, and I think that um, actually lots of church members um, equally felt that it was the right thing. So again, within FIEC, across our spectrum of churches, um, uh, the vast majority of our church leaders, our trust board, um, our congregation members felt that that was the right thing to do um, at that time. So I have I have some th- sympathy with church leaders. Also, the reality is 
And I found this as a church leader who was engaging with government. Government had made its decisions. And I think there's a lot spoken that seems to say if only church leaders were bolder, stronger, more forceful, government would do what they wanted. Um, actually, we weren't in that position at all. We were in the position of government having made decisions that were going to be imposed. Um, they listened to our concerns. They listened to our objections, but in the main, largely ignored them. So I think there was also a reality that the church had relatively little power in terms of influencing the government in, in what it did. Um, um, from a government perspective, the economy, the hospitality sector, business work, those were the areas that they were really concerned about. And a kind of churches and places of worship were of marginal concern. It's also fair to say that government had to make decisions for um, all religious groups because of the way that equality works. They weren't just making decisions for the church. Mm. They were actually making decisions for all religious groups. And I think that um, there was probably a greater concern about the spread of the virus within different religious communities. Um, there was a, a sort of an apparent greater vulnerability of some ethnicities because of um, and the ways that people were living together because of the ways they were interacting. Um, so um, government was making decisions not just for churches, but they were actually making decisions for the whole religious spectrum. So whether that be mosques, whether that be Hindu temples. And again, I can understand why government was making some of those decisions, because it wasn't simply a question of churches. Most church congregations are relatively small. Um, if, you, if though you were gathered for, say, Friday prayers in a mosque, you might have a very large percentage of the community attending. So, so government was having to wrestle not just with mm. the concerns of churches, but with actually wider um, issues of how religious kind of bodies uh, would meet, meet and come together. Yeah. Can, I, can I respond, Justin? Yeah. Oh Please. yeah, no. Again, mm. this is um, just coming from my perspective as somebody in the Church of England, um, and and what I witnessed on the ground. But I I do understand about the very beginning and how it it there was there may have been little information um, available. Although I do I do think there was some information that was available. Um, I remember reading, for example, some columns by Peter Hitchens, and I think it was Simon Jenkins in the Guardian very very early on about, for example, the track record of. Um, Neil Ferguson, um, uh, who's, who's on whose model the, the, the lockdown um, was, was largely justified. But even leaving that aside, I think the thing that was so disheartening from my perspective was the lack of ongoing or a seemingly lack of ongoing engagement with the serious pastoral, spiritual, moral issues that were involved in, in the whole process of the lockdown. And it seemed to me, again, you know, just from my my position in the Church of England, that what we were really being told by by the church, by the institution of the church, was simply to fall into line with the government response. And there was really no sort of differentiation between the government response and, and the church response whatsoever. And it was, consider one example, um, supermarkets were open. You know, I went to the supermarket, supermarket during the lockdown, um, every week uh, there were, the supermarket had lots of people in it now they there were there were lines of people outside the supermarket but um but they were nevertheless they were still open and they found a way to open uh, i believe off licenses were open during during the lockdown um off licenses so people were able to buy alcohol be in small shops uh, together as i said earlier the the churches um that in the church of england were were allowed to operate as food banks um, but we weren't allowed to worship and we weren't allowed to celebrate the sacraments. We weren't allowed to sit under the word of God. We weren't allowed to have evangelistic services. And I think it's that kind of thing, that that seeming that seeming void there, that sort of torpor that's at the heart of this response institutionally. Again, I don't know as I don't know, know enough about the FIC response to, to comment on it. But that's the thing that I that I and many other people found so disturbing about this whole thing. It was almost like we didn't want the church to open. It was almost like we wanted this to last for a longer and longer period. And we weren't willing to stand up for the importance and the centrality of Christian worship. Um, to give an example of what um, a robust response might might have looked like, I, um, in preparation for this conversation, I rewatched an excellent series of lectures that was given by Richard Turnbull for the Christian Institute in uh, November 2020. Three lectures, a biblical lecture, a historical lecture providing a historical perspective on Christian responses to the plague, Reformation response, evangelical response in the 19th century, and then a commentary on, on today's church and the kind of response that we could have to COVID-19. And he, uh, he engages across the spectrum from a theologically robust 
point of view on all of all of it, the, the, the scientific aspect as well, the technocratic and political aspect, but also the, the institutional, the theological, uh, the moral, and so on and so forth. And I think that's the kind of thing that we were lacking during the time. We were not led spiritually in that sense. And um, that's, that's what was so disappointing from my perspective. Mm -hmm. John? I think that's absolutely right. I mean, the cha the challenge I think here is that actually a lot of public figures um, who represent the church fail to adopt a robust approach in proclaiming the Christian faith in in a whole variety of areas um, of life. So that's not particularly surprising. There has been a a kind of a long term trend that high profile public religious figures, representatives of the church, fail to engage on behalf of the Christian gospel with that kind of robust um, approach. And I think this was um, probably just a continuation of of what is the reality and has been the reality. Uh, kind of all along. Um, FIEC and most evangelical churches um, have very little public voice. We're not sort of the voice that's heard. The media turns to the hierarchy of the Church of England or Catholic hierarchy. We are we are largely ignored, despite the fact that evangelicals are the growing sector of the Christian church. So there's a whole swathe of churches out there and Christians out there who would hold a much more robust view, whose voice is not heard um, in the, the kind of media. And I think we were very aware of our absence um, in that public profile. Um, I think th there's a challenge here that there are, there are two separate issues that kind of come together. One is there's no doubt that for the government, worship and the gathering for worship was not seen as being something essential. And I think that to some extent we need to recognise that that is a reality in a secular society, that we are in a situation in which um, kind of churches have dramatically declined. They are relatively marginal to national life. And I think it's a wake up call to us to realise that in the minds of the wider public and the wide minds of the government, what we think is essential is not regarded as being essential. So attending church was not seen as being the equivalent of going shopping in Sainsbury's. Uh, it was seen as more of the equivalent of choosing to go to the cinema or choosing to go out for uh, a kind of a meal, a recreational activity that had been stopped for most people. And we, we, I think we have to recognise that that's what government thought, and it was very difficult to persuade them otherwise. Um, I think it's right that we as Christian leaders want to highlight the importance of Christian worship um, and the vitality of that. So there's, there's a, 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 a theological... Mm and cultural issue of yeah. the the place of Christianity, of religion more generally within society. Um, the other side is even if you think it is important to be able to gather for worship, that raised the question of whether in these circumstances it was reasonable for worship to be suspended for a period of time. And I, I think actually the, the, the mix between what you might call the theological, cultural, um, biblical principle and the reality of a, a health crisis and how to respond to that um, is really quite complicated to work through. So again, I have some sympathy for the government. I'm not sure that going to church, participating with a group of people, being together for a period of time in the same building is quite the same as going to Sainsbury's and shopping um, and a quick in and out in which you might meet a smaller number of people. It's a, it's a different form of gathering. And in many of the churches that I know where you would have congregations of hundreds, um, quite frankly, those would be spreader events in that situation. So if you're a small parish church with a small congregation and lots of space, you might say that would have been possible to meet in a, in a safe way. Um, and when uh, eventually it, uh, things were opened up and rules on mixing and mingling were introduced, it was possible to do that. For lots of evangelical churches that are full to bursting, um, actually they wouldn't have been able to carry on in the way that they had been carrying on. So again, I, I think that the principle and the, the practicality um, are two slightly different questions. And I think yeah. the issue, issue the government was wrestling with, which I have some sympathy for, is uh, what is a reasonable response to the risk posed by um, this pandemic that we don't quite fully understand? And it's easy to look back with hindsight and say wrong calls were made, um, to say that um, a kind of an, a, an overly risk averse approach was taken. I think it's much more difficult for people to actually make that judgment at the moment. And they deserve some measure of sympathy for having to make a very hard call 
um, in the interests of the wider public. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, 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 um, I hope that I conveyed, John, in my comments earlier that um, it was yeah. a very difficult time right at the beginning. And, and what I was trying to say is, it, is, from my perspective, it was the ongoing institutional response that lasted many, many months, yeah. if not over, over a year, and has, has been, largely speaking, doubled down, doubled, doubled down on now, if I can use that, 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 mm. that past tense in that way. Well, um, can I just, sorry, Justin, can I just come back on uh, yeah, just, just a couple of things? Um, I, I hear what you're saying about in a secular society, the government not considering Christian worship essential. Um, and I again, I don't know what was going on behind closed doors, but I didn't really hear anyone in public is insisting that Christian worship is essential for the good, not only of Christians, but of society as a whole. You know, we gather together to, to render to God his due. This might be more of a, an Anglican ecclesiology, but but we do it on behalf of the people who are not doing it as well to, to intercede for them and to intercede for our nation that they might turn from their sin and and come to 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 join us in the in the true and just worship of, of God. And so to to have a to have a government that is that considers the the worship of the church Christian worship non essential is is uh, is not an acceptable state of affairs. Go on, Justin. Sorry. But you could do what you're describing there, Jamie, on Zoom. You know, people can pray, they can intercede. You know, because we have the technology, and a lot of people, you know, especially during the early days of the pandemic, you know, were we're thanking god you know for the fact that this pandemic at least had come at a time when we can actually the majority of people could do that uh, over, uh online so what what for you is the, the big difference between sort of that way of doing it and the fact that you you've obviously felt the limitations of in okay yeah i mean i can make two comments about this i think the first thing i'd like to say justin is from a legal perspective when um my friend william philip and a number of scottish uh, church leaders took the SNP to a judicial review, the secular judge said that online worship does not constitute worship from a legal perspective. And that would, that would he described it as worship light, L-I-T-E. So that would, that would hold for this country as well because our constitutions are so similar. I have it on good, on good authority that um, this would, if, if a similar judicial review were brought in this country, which was in preparation actually at the time by Christian Concern, it would almost certainly be successful for this reason. So there's a legal thing there. But I also think we, we, have, to, um, we have to say theologically that online worship cannot be considered the equivalent of the gathered congregation of God. And I would argue even from even from a lower church perspective, we, we still all agree that, for example, um, the uh, evangelization, baptism of new converts, uh, the, the taking of the Lord's Supper, however we, however we understand that, fellowship, as it says, you know, all of these are marks of the early church in Acts chapter 2. We, then um, the internet hadn't been invented, obviously, but they were talking about real in-person fellowship, uh, the cut and thrust of forgiveness and reconciliation in, in the Christian community, uh, the, the supporting and, and helping of, of weaker brethren and people in in need the caring of widow the care for widows and orphans all of these things are critically impaired if people can't leave their houses and can only meet on zoom so the the very best you could say for zoom is that it enables um, a disembodied conversation and that's that's all great you know i run a podcast on zoom we're talking on zoom now it's all it's all brilliant but it's not it's not a replacement for the the gathered church of the living god an mm. embodied christian mm. community we're, we're, I'll come back to you, John, for a response on that in just a moment. We're going to go to a quick break and um, and we'll be back. We're talking about COVID and Christianity. Did the church give away too much to the state? And generally, we'll be looking, you know, as, as we head out of this current pandemic, um, whether the church has given away too much. Uh, what are the next things that may be uh, a concern to people like Jamie? Uh, John Stevens is also with us from the FIEC. And we'll be back in just a moment. Have you ever found yourself tongue-tied when someone asks you, is there evidence for God? What about suffering? Did Jesus really rise from the dead? I'd like to introduce you to Confident Christianity, our online apologetics course, featuring video training from world-renowned thinkers such as William Lane Craig, John Lennox, Amy Or Ewing, and Gary Habermas. You'll learn how to understand, defend, and share your faith with confidence. I'll also share lessons I've learned from over 15 years of hosting atheists and Christians in dialogue. You can enroll now at premier.org.uk forward slash course 
or click the link with this video. Welcome back to today's edition of the show. COVID and Christians, did the church give away too much to the state we're asking today? Jamie Franklin is one of my guests. He's a Church of England priest who co-hosts the Irreverend podcast. And he's been critical of his own church and the national response to the COVID pandemic. Thinks it may have set a dangerous precedent for government overreach into worship, into something that he believes is essential for the moral health of the country as a whole, not just for individual Christians. Uh, on the other side of today's discussion, though agreeing with certain aspects of what Jamie has to say, but but perhaps more open to the idea that there was a necessary response uh, at the time, especially of the early lockdowns. National Director of the FIEC, John Stevens, is with me. And and John, happy for you to respond to, to what Jamie had to say there. But But one thing I did want to bring up is the fact that there were at least some instances of churches and church leaders breaking the rules, um, perhaps most famously in the US, John MacArthur, who has a large church out in California, um, got into a real tussle with the local authorities because they continued to meet. Um, at, I think initially they, they they sort of obeyed by the rules, but as as that went on, they decided actually they were going to, to meet and, and they, they got into various tussles. And there was both support and criticism from him um, in the US. Uh, other stories in the UK included uh, one church in London, North London, Angel Church, um, which um, was taken to task um, for breaking the rules for meeting. Uh, Marcus Walker within the Church of England, the priest at St. Bartholomew the Great in London, um, defied his own church's specific instruction not to go into the sanctuary and, and did actually live stream prayers and so on um, even while not having a congregation present and so on so um, I'm sure Jamie will want to comment on some of those examples but, but John what what's how did you f what's your thoughts on churches that did decide to as it were take some kind of civil disobedience into their own hands I can come back first of all just on what Jamie was saying beforehand Please. just a couple of comments about that general um, I think that how you felt about the lockdown is determined by your ecclesiology and your understanding of the mission of the church and I think actually what the Covid crisis has done has revealed that you can't put all churches together as if they are all the same they all, all will have a different view so for example I think within the Anglican church some of the Anglican church has much more of a sense of the church to the nation the priestly vocation of the church as a whole its presence there it's praying for the nation um, and, and that is it's seen as its raison d'etre, which of course is affected by a lockdown. I think lots of nonconformist churches, the church exists primarily for the people who belong and attend to that church, and the way they seek to reach the nation is through the sharing of the gospel. Of course, still praying for the nation, but it's not seen in quite such a priestly sacramental way, which means that the church is able to continue its ministry in other forms, whether that be um, on online or whatever. Um, again, I would want to say I don't think that any of our churches thought that online was a replacement for physical worship. There was a lot of debate in this kind of um, crisis about you know, consumer Christians and uh, is everybody going to be want to be sitting on the sofa at home with a cup of coffee rather than coming to church? Um, and I think actually there are some sections of evangelicalism which are consumerist. I think some of the churches that have suffered most in this period are those for whom their gathering is primarily the equivalent of a mass pop concert. They have large numbers of attenders who want to come for that for the experience. They're not really committed, engaged church members. And those churches have struggled because essentially church is a, a consumer experience. So there are some elements of that within evangelicalism, but no, nobody in our churches was saying, oh great, we're going to move to online worship because that's going to be so much better and more people are going to be able to come and you're not going to have to turn up. Um, actually, it was a temporary provision for which we were grateful in circumstances in which we couldn't do what we would uh, want to do on an ordinary basis. So I think ecclesiology matters as well. Legally, um, uh, Jamie talked about the kind of the judicial review that took place in Scotland. I followed that case quite closely and the court there did conclude that the Scottish regulations were unlawful. But it's really interesting to understand why they decided that. They decided that because the Scottish government hadn't taken into account sufficiently the um, uh, uh, kind of the, the legal principle of the right to freedom of, uh, of religion. And under the kind of Human Rights Act, the European Convention on Human Rights in England, we have a, a protection for freedom of religion and worship. But that's not absolute. It is balanced against the public interest. And what the court concluded was the government hadn't shown that it had sufficiently taken that into account in making its decision. Decision. They didn't say that government couldn't close churches, that that would always be inappropriate. It, it's actually a balance between the risk and, and the freedom as those rights conflict. And very interestingly, in the Scottish case, in order to win, 
the um, people who were bringing the case conceded on singing. So one of the big issues for churches was, should we be allowed to sing or, or not sing? To get the result, the, the, the people who brought that case accepted that government could be entitled to um, direct that churches should not sing. So it's a, in some ways, it's a bit of a Pyrrhic victory. And I think the same would be true in um, uh, the kind of in England, if a case were brought here, that there is a principle of balancing our freedoms against kind of um, the protection of the public. And that's always been the case, whether in times of plague, illness, kind of war, certain restrictions on our freedom of religion have been permitted. So that's just by comment on, on that, that situation. Now, again, I, I want minimal restrictions necessary. And I think at points, the government's approach, its guidance um, uh, was far too long lasting. Measures were kept in pace for which there was relatively little justification. Um, and I think um, that is that is true um, of the, the, the crisis as it unfolded. In actual fact, um, um, when we came to the second and the third lockdowns, churches were much more uh, permitted to remain open than had been the case in the first lockdown, which is precisely because the government knew that there was that balance between public protection and, and freedom of worship. And therefore, they didn't restrict churches, particularly in the third lockdown, in the way that they restricted other elements of society, like, for example, hospitality venues, cinemas and, and theatres. So to some extent, our legal rights were reflected in the way that the regulations were crafted in the subsequent um, kind of lockdowns. I think in relation to churches that chose to disobey, um, in the UK there were very few churches that chose to do that. To my knowledge, very few that actively decided that they were going to break the law. Um, uh, it was difficult because there was a mix of law and guidance. Some things weren't legally required. They were guidance, but that was quite complicated because the guidance was also part of health and safety regulation. Um, within FIEC, we took it as our view to primarily tell our churches what the law and guidance required. Obviously, it's up to them to decide how to implement that. But the view that the majority of our churches took, the view that I took, was that we have a duty to obey the law unless it's in direct conflict with kind of the commands of Christ. Uh, and I think our judgment was that because of the nature of the circumstances in this instance, um, uh, we didn't see there as being a conflict between what government was requiring and what um, uh, uh, sort of Christ required, what the, the word of God demands. Although we could see that if the restrictions became um, repressive, they weren't removed as quickly as possible, we could have been in a situation in which we might have thought that that was the case. But mercifully, the government did remove the restrictions and of course they're no, they're no longer sort of there. Um, in the, this country there were a very small number of high profile cases. I think rightly Christians tended to pursue a legal route of judicial review rather than simply disobeying the law. The case of the church in Angel is fascinating. I know a little bit about that case. It was a church that they appeared on the Sunday programme on Radio 4 saying we're going to break the law, we don't believe these laws, we're going to kind of meet. The police then turned up to their gathering their response was very interesting. They then said, oh, we're not breaking the law. We're having sort of support group meetings. And um, actually half the congregation met inside the building and half outside, which is kind of ironic because having made that great stand, when it came to it, what they told the police was we're not breaking the law at all. So even that apparently high profile case of some kind of deliberate flaunting of the law actually turned out in the end to be people saying we're making use of the um, sort of support group uh, uh, kind of provision which is especially for people who are sort of vulnerable drug addicts, mental health Ill illness issues, which wonderfully that church is reaching many people from that background. So even a high profile case in England that appeared to be breaking the law when it came to the crunch, um, they made the argument that they were actually complying with the law. Now, I think America is very different. It's different culturally. It's different legally in terms of the rights of churches. Um, uh, 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 different states adopted different approaches. Um, I do think there is more of an anti-government, anti-authoritarian strain within um, American culture and American Christianity. Um, I, I, I understand why Christians want to assert the right to be able to um, worship. Um, I think some of the uh, spokesmen in the states that was mixed up with a denial of COVID. It was mixed up with attitudes of whether or not COVID was a serious threat or not. And I think in much of the discourse, the theological principle um, uh, got very mixed up with issues of whether or not COVID is 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 a real um, uh, uh, kind of risk. Um, uh, and, and I think that it was quite hard to see your way between those two positions.
Yeah, uh, well, so um, just to say about the the legal case in Scotland, I think it's I think it's going slightly far to call it a pyrrhic victory, c- considering I think you even just said yourself, John, that it was at least in part the reason why the church was allowed to stay open during the third lockdown. So that that seems to me to be um, a, a very significant victory uh, rather than a, a, a pyrrhic victory. Um, the, in in terms of the legal thing, I think there's. Um, the theological point I, I think we would have some agreement on is that the civic uh, authority from a biblical perspective probably does have in some circumstances the the right given by God to to tell Christians not to worship under certain circumstances. So, for example, this is an example I, I read on uh, Doug Wilson's blog, um, who's a pastor in America. Uh, you, you imagine that there's some kind of um, sniper on the other side of the road to a church, and he's about to open fire, and the police know about this. Now, they go into the church, and they say to the people, get out of the church right now, because somebody's about to kill all the people in here. You should obey from a biblical perspective what what is going on because there's a there's a serious imminent uh, tangible threat to the church uh, right there and then. But if that happened for ten Sundays in a row, say, and there was no real evidence that there was a sniper outside, or it was at least highly questionable that there was one, you might think again. Now I'm not drawing an exact analogy with COVID. I'm just trying to bring some clarity to the situation from a from a scriptural uh, perspective. Um, clearly, there are times when you should obey, but those times are very, very exceptional and extreme. And the question in, in in the case of the COVID situation, I have to say, John, I do think it's important that we, we do um, engage not just with the official line from Chris Whitty and, and whomever over, you know, how many people are going to die if we do X, Y and Z, but a more general, uh, balanced and robust take on what we're being told. The question is, is the civil magistrate overreaching his legitimate authority to close the church. And I think that once you're in a position where you answer yes that question, then from a scriptural perspective, you would probably conclude that you should keep your church open because we are commanded by God in scripture. Uh, unless there are these exceptional circumstances to meet together and worship God. Now, I'm not making a comment about when that line has been crossed, but I would say that that is the framing of the issue. The other thing about the American situation is the argument, I think, would be that in Romans 13, we're told that God has instituted government to, to bring um, you know, justice via the sword, to bring um, order and so on and so forth. Now, what I imagine somebody like John MacArthur would say is that what was actually going on was unconstitutional. So the, the order which God has put in place was actually being subverted by the actions of the, the state government. Or, or whomever, or you know, the, the president, or whomever. So it's actually a question of upholding the order, the civic order in, in the US. Um, I wouldn't like to go on any further on that because I'm not an expert in constitutional law. But I think that there's a there's a there's a, there's a scriptural principle there as well. I mean, what do you make of John's point, Jamie? Though that it was also there was a certain amount of um, mixed in with that questioning of you know, just how serious the COVID pandemic was. And I've got to say my timeline, you know, it was often Christians who were uh, in the US, especially questioning, you know, the narrative around that. I think you've probably questioned exactly what the narrative is on that as well. And and to, to that extent, do you think the church on both sides of the Atlantic or whatever has, has been too much kind of simply following, you know, the official pronouncements from the top? Oh, um, yeah, I, I think so. so. Has the church been too, too much for, for um following the official the official line um yeah yeah i i think i think so for sure um i think we can see even now justin that there's there's um, a retrospective critique of what happened i mean um i'm sure we're all aware of uh, rishi sunak's comments over over the last couple of weeks um trying to distance himself uh, from the decision to lock down and indeed um liz truss as, as well so i believe that retrospectively the 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 narrative is actually um is actually changing and the tide is turning on this one but but certainly at the time um it's it's uh, <laughs> It is our responsibility to engage our minds 
uh, and also to open our Bibles and to do our theological reflection as well. And if we're being told something that's highly questionable from an epistemic or an epistemological perspective, we don't have to simply accept it just because it's being told us by the government. Um, I gave the example of the, uh, the Neil Ferguson model. Now, I don't think anyone really denies that that model, which was produced, I think it was on the 16th of March 2020, that model was the initial justification for the lockdown in the UK and in the USA as well. And we had a pre-pandemic plan. You can go on the government website and read the pandemic pre-pandemic plan. It clearly talks about mitigating against the virus, but also seeing society carry on as normal. It talks about the importance of keeping the economy open and so 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 on and so forth. Um, the, the idea of the lockdown really came from China, from the Chinese Communist Party. It was uh, who are who are um, wicked beyond beyond description. It was first implemented in Italy, and then it was implemented here on the basis of, of Ferguson's model. Now, this is not a conspiracy theory. Neil Ferguson himself has actually said said that he didn't think that we could get away with this in this country because it would have been too, too draconian. So, I'm just giving you some some idea of the reason that people were uncomfortable with. Um, with this. And I think as a Christian, as a part of the church, it's entirely legitimate to say that we can comment on these things prophetically and say that and question at least whether this is for the common good of society or whether it's actually more damaging to implement these things uh, than not. Mm, go on. Can I come back on a couple of things uh, Jamie said? I think, I think um, this question of the authority of the church and, uh, and state and how those relate is a really important kind of question. And I think Christians tend to sort of fall into two different categories. And again, it's important to distinguish these. Some people seem to adopt an absolute view. They basically take the view that the state has no ro role over the church at all. It has no right to be able to interfere. It has no right in any circumstances to shut worship, to tell churches that they cannot meet. Um, that seems to be re represented by the kind of Frankfurt Declaration that's been sort of recently issued by a group of Christian leaders, predominantly from the States, but also in Europe. It seems to adopt that absolutist approach. There is the state and it can have no role in relation to the church. Um, I think most of us actually adopt the position that Jamie said, that in some circumstances, it may well be right that government can take the decision that in the public interest kind of worship or the way that church conducts itself um, uh, kind of should be restricted. And we actually live with a massive amount of restriction and regulation of church life, planning, health and safety, employment legislation, insurance, accounting. You know, you can't do what you want um, as a church in our, in our contemporary society. You have to comply with a vast swathe of legislation and rules that the vast majority of churches hap happily go along with. So that then means that the debate really becomes a question of the reasonableness of the measures that are introduced. And I think actually it's really important that sometimes people elevate it to the level of a, an absolute theological position. Well, if that's your position, then in principle you should be free to meet no matter what's happening, no matter how serious the plague, no matter what the consequences. And I didn't hear anybody in Britain arguing that if this were a, a really um, terrible virus that could potentially kill millions of people, we ought to be able to meet irrespective. So much of the debate really is about the principle of reasonableness and proportionality. And I, and I think um, actually we just need to be clear that that's what's at stake. And the difference between lots of Christians on this was really about whether they thought the measures that were introduced were reasonable in relation to the risk um, that was being uh, kind of presented. And I think for church leaders, I think of myself in this, I'm actually we're not experts in the science we're not experts in making that judgment there were diverse opinions but there was also a majority scientific opinion um, and it's not just Neil Ferguson there's a whole body of people providing advice um, there are a whole group of evangelical kind of doctors scientists statisticians who are also reflecting on what's being said and I think it's worth recognizing that judgments had to be made when the facts weren't known and, and actually, we do live in a more risk averse society. Uh, and I think when we look back, we'll be able to say, were right calls made? The challenge is you're making that judgment in the light of known facts. Um, actually, the decisions had to be made at the moment in which you didn't know. You could only really operate on the basis of models and predictions. And of course, the thing that we don't know is it's, it's equally simply a model and a prediction to say um, what would have been the consequences if we'd done nothing. So the whole evaluation process is quite difficult. And at one level, I think the vast majority of Christians and churches were prepared to trust the government experts, the discuss, discuss, 
the discussions that were being had, um, and particularly the fact that we had an, an intrinsically libertarian prime minister um, adopting measures that we knew he didn't want to adopt. This was not a government seizing the opportunity to be tyrannical because they could do. We know that it's, it runs against the entire philosophy of the prime minister of the time. And I think that gave some comfort to Christians um, as government made these choices. And, and as you respond, Jamie, I, I should have mentioned this earlier, but the Frankfurt Declaration is quite an interesting thing. It's it's uh, this recent statement uh, that's been signed by a number of church leaders across the world, including yourself, Jamie, uh, around the, 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 the limits, I suppose, of Christian and civil liberties. Um, I, I could mention some of the articles here, actually. God the creator as sovereign lawgiver and judge. God as the source of truth and the role of science, mankind as the image of God, God given mandates and the limits of authority and Christ as the head of the church. Perhaps you'd, yeah. you'd like to speak to that. But yeah, sure, sure, sure. Absolutely. Well. Absolutely. So I was just making a note because I want to come back on, on something else. Um, yeah. So I didn't write the Frankfurt Declaration. I wasn't involved in drafting it, but I think it I think it broadly speaking reflects um, what you might call a sphere sovereignty view of society, which is that there are independent or let's call them interdependent autonomous spheres within society under God. So obvious ones would be, for example, the government, the church, the family and so on and so forth. Now, I'd be surprised, I'm not certain about this, but I'm surprised if anyone would, would say that those spheres are absolutely autonomous and that they don't sort of have anything to do with, with one another. There is a certain amount of permeability between the, the spheres. They sort of, um, you know, one can affect the other legitimately. So an example would be, for example, that um, if there is an abusive father in a family or something, it's perfectly legitimate for the state to intervene in that um, situation. But broadly speaking, they have their own God given autonomy. The state does not grant the other institutions the right to exist. And I think that's the that's the most important thing. Just because, for example, my family exists in this geographical territory, it is not cre created or legitimized by the state. And that's the same. That's the same for the church. The church has its own autonomy, its own independence uh, from the state. And the state shouldn't treat the family, it shouldn't treat the church as though it's in complete and total control of them and i think that's the that's the concern of the people who have written the frankfurt declaration is that the, is that we we are lapsing into a totalitarian view of society where the state has total control over over everything and um you can well i mean it's all tied into this question of this kind of warlike footing we were put on during the during the uh, covid situation but the worry is of course that that will be um, maintained that it will be proliferated uh, mission creep if you like the same thing that happened after the first and second world war so so i think that that's a that's a serious concern there but I, just to bring a bit of clarity i think that's what they're saying i hope it is anyway the other thing i would just say mm. just like to come back to uh, this question of expertise um I think one of the points that could have been made at the time is that um, there was far too much of an emphasis on the scientific expertise of the people who were involved in these decisions. And to me, from the political perspective, it was really an abdic abdication of responsibility when we were told by, for example, Boris Johnson that they were simply following the science. Um, the business of government is to take scientific um, predictions and so on into account and to balance them against the other considerations and needs of society to say that the science I'm not saying you're saying this John um, but I'm just saying to say that the science is the, the only important thing the only thing that matters in a society is to capitulate to a kind of uh, technocratic view uh, which is that we should just have experts ruling over us and they can tell us what's important in life. It reminds me of um, a comment by C.S. Lewis in an essay he wrote for um, The Observer all those years ago uh, called Is Progress Possible? when he said um, something like, the doctor can tell me the condition I have and the treatment that I will need to cure it, but ultimately it's up to me whether or not life is worth living at that price. So I'm not, I'm not meaning to frame it in an individualistic way. I'm just saying it's up to the government to take that into account and then to make political decisions, which, is, which are holistic and not narrowly scientific decisions. And I think there was a serious problem with that rhetoric of following the science for that reason. Hmm. Uh, I, 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 I don't know whether for you, John, you feel that things like the Frankfurt Declaration are necessary to kind of reassert the fact that obviously some churches feel there has been this mission creep, as, as Jamie puts it, and that we need to 
be clear that actually the church has its own authority and will not necessarily be sort of told what to do by the state um i, I mean do you share any of those concerns that this could be a precedent for further intrusions on civil and religious liberties and so on and I think actually the principle of religious liberty and civil liberties are hugely important and they've been long fought for and hard fought for within Britain. They're protected under the Human Rights Act. I think in large measure we've seen the government respecting that and I don't fear in our context that those religious liberties are going to be overthrown. That doesn't seem to be the way that government is navigating the challenges of being a secular society with a variety of different religious faith communities within it. So I don't share sort of the, the, the fear that, that, that there is an imminent overturning of civil and religious liberty. Um, that seems to underlie the thinking of some of the drafters of the Frankfurt Declaration. I think that probably reflects very much an American context, which is very different. Um, I, I sort of Jamie talked about the whole lot theory of sphere sovereignty, which I understand, but I think is very much an American perspective. Um, I don't think it basically reflects biblical teaching as to the nature of how the state and church relate, nor Christian history. I think it is a product of the American particular context um, uh, uh, that kind of seeks to differ differentiate this separation of powers it reflects the very way the, way the American Constitution is developed and pragmatically it may well be a very uh, uh, an effective way of helping society to be able to operate I think it's been elevated to a biblical principle in a way that's not justified and I think if you asked Christians in the first century or for most of Christian history if this was the way the Bible described the relationship between church and state the kingdom of God and the kingdom of the world they would find it unrecognizable so um, I have some really serious theological questioning as to whether or not that is um, a way of rightly describing the relationship between state and church. It seems to me that it's an ideal and that it effectively represents an over-realised eschatology of what we can expect in this world at this particular time. So to me, I think theologically I have questions about the precise way it's framed, although I also want to protect religious freedom and religious liberty. I actually think that 1 Timothy chapter 2, the, the way we're to pray for kings and all those in authority so that we live quiet and peaceful lives in all godliness, so that the good news of Jesus, the one redeemer, can spread, is a manifesto for religious liberty, um, even in a country which is led by a, a kind of a pagan, non-Christian uh, kind of ruler and authority. So that, that concern is, um, is great. I might problem with the Frank Frankfurt Declaration is its absolutism, that it takes those principles and it absolutizes uh, a version of sphere sovereignty and then it even more than that absolutizes application in terms of saying the state can have no role in determining how the church conducts its ministry but the reality is we do that all the time we're regulated in all sorts of ways I, I, I'd be really interested how Jamie reacts to it as an Anglican because it seems to me that the Frankfurt Declaration is actually contrary to the very essence of Anglicanism as a state church. I mean, the history of Anglicanism is a state-imposed church with a state-granted doctrine. The doctrines of the Church of England were not decided by the church, they were decided by Parliament that passed the Book of Common Prayer, the 39 Articles. The bishops were appointed by Parliament. So the British relationship between church and state in its Anglican model is utterly opposed to the very way that the kind of Frankfurt Declaration describes the relationship between Christ and, and uh, church and state. I think it runs counter to all of the magisterial reformation understanding of the relationship between um, church and state. So the irony here is, as a, a nonconformist Baptist, I'm much closer to the Frankfurt Declaration in its understanding. I don't quite understand how those who belong to magisterial reformation churches like the Presbyterians and the Anglicans could possibly find it a document that they could agree with because it mm. seems to undercut something very significant theologically about how they understand relationship between church yep. and state. Well let, let's come back to you in a moment for that Jamie. We're going to go to another quick break and then then we'll continue talking. Um, yes uh, Covid and Christianity did the church give away too much to the state? We've obviously started talking about this Frankfurt Declaration as well, um, which a number of church leaders have signed who are concerned about the impingement of religious liberties uh, by the state. So um, we'll keep talking about this on the other side of a quick break. You're listening to Unbelievable. For more conversations between Christians and skeptics, subscribe to the Unbelievable podcast. And for more updates and bonus content, sign up to the Unbelievable newsletter. So we've been talking about COVID and Christianity, um, looking back at those first lockdowns, whether the church gave too much to the state, whether it had the right kind of voice and approach, um, you know, whether 
things were taken into account properly, holistically and so on. Talking about this Frankfurt Declaration as well. Uh, Jamie, you, you did sign the declaration along with many others. John, John asked in that last segment whether it even makes sense, though, from the point of view that you're an Anglican priest. And there's obviously been that interaction of church and state historically for a long time there can you draw these strict boundaries therefore as as an anglican yourself yeah well i did say that my answer well so firstly i'm not uh, an apologist for um sphere sovereignty it just seemed to me upon a cursory reading of the of the um the manifesto that it was something that i broadly speaking agreed with uh, but i did say that the I, I i my understanding is that the spheres are not completely impermeable that there is permeability between the spheres also, again, this is probably an issue of ecclesiology largely. I'm, I have more of an Anglo-Catholic ecclesiology, so I would see uh, the Church of England as being part of the Catholic Church, small c Catholic Church, and so being constituted not by Parliament, primarily by Parliament on, and the Sovereign, although they would, bear, uh, they would have a role, but by the historic episcopate and the sacraments of the Church and, and by the preaching of the Word and so on and so forth. Um, so... So I think that's that would be where I would start. But don't get me wrong, John, I, I didn't write the statement and I wouldn't I wouldn't die for it. Um, so so that's what I would say. Can I come back to this thing about um, mm. the uh, concern about state overreach? Mm. Now, we are living n seemingly on the other side of this. And as I say, we've got Sunak and um, the Prime Minister Liz Truss seemingly distancing themselves from what what happened and I, I consider that to be really really good and I hope that the, the conversation moves on and that people see uh, that what happened broadly speaking was was catastrophic and that it will never it will never happen again um, the the most worrying moment for me was when there was talk of vaccine passports being imposed in our churches and indeed I was involved in writing a letter which uh, almost 2,000 church leaders signed uh, expressing serious concern about this now that that to my mind would be be a, a moment if that had happened that would have been a moment where where a line was crossed in an unambiguous way where the government was asking the church to divide the body of christ on the basis of a a distinction which they were making a man-made distinction now to my mind that would be a serious step away let's say from from what we're commanded to do in scripture from the very heart and essence of the gospel and I, d I don't want to give myself too much credit i don't know how much effect our letter had it was in all the the mainstream press uh, it was picked up by the bbc and so on and so forth and so i like to think that we had some some impact there i don't know perhaps i'm being naive but that was seriously seriously worrying and that was a time when um it would have been nice to hear from somebody in the hierarchy saying, hang on a second, uh, even though, you know, I think this about the vaccine and, or whatever it might have been, nevertheless, we cannot have the government telling us that we have to turn away people from churches because they've not been vaccinated. So, so Lord willing, we will continue to have li religious liberty and this kind of thing will not happen in this country. But the very fact that it was being suggested was to me a serious concern. Hmm. John, what was your thoughts on that particular suggestion? Yeah, I mean, I think the fact that it didn't happen is an indication of the value we place on civil liberties in the UK. Um, I think there was, on a whole variety of issues, a lot of lobbying behind the scenes of government to not introduce. So I was involved in a group that met with government ministers regularly of church leaders across the whole spectrum and lobbying on things like face coverings, singing, uh, vaccine passports, wanting that not to be introduced. So I take the point that perhaps some of the hierarchy didn't speak in public in quite the way that we might have wanted. Um, but there's also a challenge for the church, actually, there's, there's it's important to reflect on the difference between campaigning with government to influence its policy and what you then do if government implements that particular policy. And again, I think it's a matter of judgment the the, the, the desire to have vaccine passports was in the circumstances actually out of a motivation to want to enable society to open up. Um, now, you might think that's not necessary. And in the end, quite rightly, government decided it, it wasn't kind of necessary. So, again, I want to be slightly careful to be absolutist and say that in no circumstances could that ever be needed. Interestingly, the um, kind of Frank Frankfurt Declaration, one of its principles is nobody can ever be coerced by the state to be vaccinated. Interestingly, I was reading a book by Simon Heffer called High Minds, which is a history of Victorian England. 
And I hadn't realised this, but actually vaccination of children in the 19th century was made compulsory by law. And that had the consequence of eliminating a wide variety of diseases that caused significant kind of infant mortality. So uh, uh, at one level, again, I want to be not drawing an absolutist principle. I don't think the theological principle um, automatically determines one single outcome on that question. And I think it, it is a judgment call. Now, my judgment call at the time at which government was making that proposal was it wasn't the right call. And that's what government government um, chose to do. So I just want to navigate very carefully the distinction between an absolute position and what is in effect a position of a kind of judgment and wisdom um, in, in the circumstances. And I think that reflects on something we've talked about, which is this whole language of state overreach. That's not the way that I, I articulate the relationship between church and state and when we should obey and when we shouldn't. I, th I think lots of things we do as Christians and in life are not mandated by the Bible. They're judgments that we make within the parameters of the Bible, but we make our own choices as to what we, we want to do. I think my fear with the language of overreach is it seems to say that if, if, if the state does something that we don't think it has the power to do, that gives us the right to disobey even if that's actually only impinging on a free choice that the Bible doesn't mandate. Now, that again reflects an American context. That's the essence of the American Revolution and how American Christians justify the rebellion um, against the, the, the kind of British and the War of Independence. This whole idea that government is limited and if government exceeds the scope of its authority, you've got a right, if not a duty, to rebel. Um, I, I don't think that's particularly biblical. I think the way the Bible thinks about it is God raises up the government that we've got and we have a duty to submit and obey to the authorities unless there is a direct conflict with what Christ commands us to do. And what Christ commands us to do is not the same as what we think we would like to do in our kind of human judgments. So differentiating that, um, is government impinging on my free choice or is government requiring me to disobey Christ is exactly the area to be navigated, I think, in, in this kind of scenario. I find that I find that somewhat um well, uh, it's somewhat questionable, I would, I would say, John, and maybe that we don't have enough time to go into this too deeply theologically. But um, if we look at Romans 13, for example, it, it's clear that God gives the authority to the, the, civil, the civil authorities, let's say. It's, it's given by God. Um, but it's for a specific purpose, isn't it? It's for justice and order in society. It's not just arbitrarily to tell people what to do. It, so, for example, if the government said, right, well, everyone needs to go outside on Thursday morning and hop on one leg. I mean, that would be it wouldn't maybe exceeding the limits of their authority is a wrong language, but it would be an inappropriate use of the authority. Do you not see a category for something like that? Um, I do. But of course, and um, the reality is that that's the kind of example that, that no government is likely to do. I, I just think when I read the New Testament texts, Romans 13, um, 1 Peter, chapter 2, Titus, um, uh, the message is to the Christians to submit, obey, honour and respect, that um, in a sense refusing to obey is, a, is an extreme position. The church occasionally takes that when they're commanded not to speak in the name of Christ or whatever, but I don't think we should forget that the governments that are being described there are the Roman Empire and its authorities and you have to say in our terms massive overreach on the part of those um, governments in the way that they regulate lives. They're hardly sort of just equitable fair governments in the way that we're used to and yet those are the very governments um, that the New Testament is instructing Christians to submit to. So uh, as I read those texts, you're absolutely right. They talk about the ideal of what government is for, but in a flawed world, we know that we fall short of that. But I think what's striking about those New Testament passages is submission and obedience is being urged to governments that quite clearly have overreached within the categories of those who believe in sphere sovereignty and this idea of kind of a, a limited government power. I mean, are, are you are you worried, Jamie, that there is a sort of nefarious intention behind the government that, that actually they are trying to kind of test the waters and see how much they can get away with? Are you worried that this could lead to further Im impingements? I don't know. You know, obviously, lots of people are often worried about whether um, churches being able to hold a traditional orthodox view of sexuality, for instance, you know, is something that can be done, you know, in the society we live in. Is is that 
do you see that as the next battleground? What, what's your oh, Well, I'd be hesitant to predict what the next battleground would be, but I would certainly say that um, the constitutional setup of, of our nation and many nations in the West, including America, is predicated on the Christian view that um, human beings are sinful, and when you give them power, that power inevitably corrupts them. All power corrupts, absolute power corrupts absolutely, as, as I believe it was Lord Acton who said. So this is why we have a limited executive. This is why we have checks and balances and so on and so forth. Um, so the problem is when, when people are given, um, uh, given an extraordinary amount of power in extenuating circumstances, it becomes very hard for them to give up that power or to see that power in, in perspective. No one's saying it's a sort of, um, you know, something which is done intentionally or anything like that, although it may very well be, who knows. Um, but we are saying that there's a danger, um, or I'm saying that there's a danger when people have that kind of power and that indeed our, our whole political system is is uh, predicated um, on that observation, which I think is a deeply Christian one. Um, in, terms of, in terms of my sort of immediate concerns, as I say, at the moment, things seem okay. But it could be the case that as an orthodox Christian view on something like sexuality or, or human biological sex becomes increasingly unacceptable, and indeed it is becoming increasingly unacceptable in society, even to the point of becoming in some cases illegal to manifest these views i do think there's a i do think there's a serious well there's a serious challenge i think coming down the road unless unless things change and of course i hope i hope they do i hope there is a i hope there's a christian revival in this nation and that the nation turns around uh, but unless that does happen and we carry on going in this this direction i i do think there are going to be serious challenges ahead for orthodox christians yeah can i come back on that um justin mm. um, and i think i i yeah i i think one of the things that worries me is that um, I think focusing on COVID and everything that happened in relation to COVID um, seems to me to be a danger of distracting us from where the real battles are, because I actually think there are really serious religious liberty issues that are going to impact on the church, and there are points at which we may need to exercise civil disobedience. Um, uh, uh, COVID for me, I think there was a reasonable approach the government took. I think it lasted far too long, and some of the restrictions on what churches could do, singing, face masks and stuff, should have gone earlier. Um, but I, I, at one level, I think it is the issue of human sex sexuality it's the place of the gospel in society um, I, I think that the proposals on conversion therapy that are coming which could very easily severely restrict the ability of uh, Christian ministers to care for those who are struggling with same-sex attraction the idea that banning praying with somebody who's struggling with a temptation um, uh, the restriction on preaching about human sexuality um, uh, we started talking about the problems of the church hierarchy there's a case going on at the moment of a chaplain of a school who um, was basically dismissed because of preaching or a human sexuality or from a biblical perspective I don't know the full details but it's been reported that the the Bishop of Derby and others have submitted evidence to the sort of uh, the uh, kind of tribunal that's going on saying that actually that teaching is a safeguarding risk well if the church is making its it's stating that its own orthodox position on human sexuality is a safeguarding risk then what's going to stop the government from preventing churches from preaching and teaching and helping people who are struggling with issues of sexuality i think that's where the real battle will come for issues of religious liberty and rather like christians in victoria in australia and in canada we're going to have to make choices as to whether or not we obey government restrictions on gospel ministry or whether we're willing to um disobey now that's the point at which i think there's a clear conflict between what kind of um, Christ commands the church to do um, and what the state is saying the church um, should do. Um, and I don't want to get lost in debates about COVID over an issue which seems to be more of a judgment on a, on a health public safety issue. And actually, um, I think we need to be helping and equipping Christians to face those very real challenges that I think are potentially going to have significant implications for churches in the coming years. Yep. I, I, I just say I completely agree with John. We covered uh, Bernard Randall's case in in, in uh, the last episode of Irreverent. And it really is extraordinary to hear a safeguarding officer within the Church of England saying that not only the church's teachings constitute a safeguarding risk, but the church itself constitutes a safeguarding risk. It is absolutely shocking and very worrying. Well, perhaps we'll have a, 
many more debates i'm sure are are due on those sorts of issues as we go forward as you say those are the the bigger long-term issues that the church um you know is is going to be approaching but for now um jamie and john thank you very much for being so gracious in your interactions on this particular thank you justin thank you john thank you for more conversations between christians and skeptics subscribe to the unbelievable podcast and for more updates and bonus content sign up to the unbelievable newsletter